I want to welcome everyone to the Arizona State Museum Zoom talk series. I'm Lisa Falk. I'm head of community engagement for the museum, and I'm your host for this afternoon. As many of you know, Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona. We're located in Tucson on the ancestral lands of the Tana Atom Nation and Pascal Yaqui tribe. The museum's collections and research focus on the indigenous people of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. And we present programs exploring the history and cultures of this region. This month, our focus has been on Arizona foodways. Today, our last talk for the season looks at indigenous food systems work being undertaken by the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture. I'm happy to welcome staff of the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Let me share a bit of these skilled and creative food systems workers background with you. Nina Sayovsitz was born and raised in Slovenia, and when she found her way to the Sonoran Desert, she stayed. Lucky for us. Her passion for bringing together plants, people, and self-determination drives her work and leads her to also serve as, led her to also serve as program director for Tana Atom Community Actions Beginning Farmer Training Program, their Youth Garden Program, and the Farm to School Programming, and other traditional foods outreach programming, which she did from 2010 to 2014. At the same time, in 2008, she founded the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture, uh, and today she serves as its CEO. Sterling Johnson is a member of the Tonatum Nation. He is from a well-known ranching and rodeo family and is respected knowledge bearer and mentor to youth and adults. At the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture, he manages the gardens and farms and the seed library, as well as their farmer's markets. Dion Vega of the Tonatum and, of Tonatum and Latino Roots was born and raised in Ajo. She is fiercely dedicated to her community, including serving on the board of the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture. She's leading the development of the Ajo Farmers Market and Cafe, a micro business incubator and farm to table restaurant. As a chef, she excels in cooking with plants of the borderlands, adjusting them to the modern palate while deeply honoring their traditional roots. Good afternoon and greetings from Ajo. Thank you, Miss Lisa, for having us. We um, already asked all the participants to, um, here we go, to um, share a food memory. And um, we do that in our presentations um, because we want to center everybody, both the presenters and those participating, because there is no really a boundary or a line between us. Um, you know, we are all people, we all come from a land, and we all come from people. Um, so food for us is a big connector. And when we think about who we are and where we come from, and then the work we do, um, you know, we usually start with sharing our food memory. Um, and the way we're going to do this presentation today, I'll walk us through some um, bigger picture issues, and then we're going to go into more, a little bit more into programming and where um, Sterling and Dion will share their work and their approaches. And the main thing is we want to show you who we are and how we do work on the ground. Um, you know, the big title, there is no autumn word for food sovereignty is to remind us how does community work happen in the food systems? Um, you know, it often happens around the kitchen table and this is what we're doing today. We're actually sitting around the kitchen table um, you know, drinking with our phones nearby and talking and dreaming um, what we want to do next, but also, you know, again, firmly grounded in where we are and what we do. So I guess I do have my own food memory. Um, for me, June is always a month of cherries. Um, and um, that is because where I come from, Slovenia, that's when the cherries arrive. And my mom would always make cherry strudel for my dad's, um, not birthday, but like Saint's Day in Slovenia. That's what we celebrate. So it was a special treat my mom would make for my dad with cherries he would grow. And my dad really loved the cherries, but even more, he loved the cherry trees. He loved the cherry wood to work with. And so for me, Today, I celebrate my father and um, um, everything he has, um, you know, given me and given my family. Um, so that's my 
food memory. And um, the work we're doing with the Aho Center for Sustainable Agriculture is just a small fraction of what the systems food, um, food systems work can do. And, um, you know, I listed some ideas, we listed some ideas why it matters, and I'm sure I don't need to convince you all um, why it matters, and I hope that by the end of today's presentation, you will, you know, have an insight how a Native community and a tri-national community, a mixed, culturally diverse community is trying to help itself through food. Um, where we are, just for a small orientation, um, you see, like, all the way in the middle of nowhere, in a way, that's where Ajo is. Um, and what's between Tucson and Ajo is the Dawn Autumn Nation, as I will show on the second slide. So we're about two hours south of Phoenix and about two and a half hours of a normal drive west of Tucson. Um, we are about 40 miles north of the border, but um, our community, as I said, the uh, community of Ajo is very tri-national, about a third of um, Hispanic, third um, Native, and third Anglos and immigrants like myself. Um, the Dawn Autumn Nation, we are a Native American government nonprofit, and the Dawn Autumn Nation is that missing point between Tucson and Ajo, which is what you see on the next slide. And just for those who are not from here, or even maybe for those of you who are from here, the Dawn Autumn Nation is the size of Connecticut or the size of my own country, Slovenia, where I come from. So it's a big land mass and um, it has um, about 32,000 um, um, members of the Dawn Autumn Nation, but not all of them live on the reservation. The capital is Sels, and that's um, kind of important because some programming we do, we do there as well. And unfortunately, both AHO and the nation share some very dire statistical data, like um, incredibly high levels of poverty, um, lack of job opportunities, um, um, high rates of unemployment. Um, and unfortunately, the flip side of that is um, dire health situation. We're talking about um, more than average levels of obesity and diabetes, and it has to do with the fact that there is not a whole lot of food accessible in this area. Again, the state, the size of the state of Connecticut. There is not much between Ajo and Tucson or Ajo and um, but basically Bacay. So you are talking about, um, you know, for us, the closest Walmart is in Bakai, which is um, about an hour and a half away. Um, so almost a hundred miles away. That comes into play when we're gonna be finishing up our presentation, what happened with COVID in our area. So we, I hope we know where we are. Um, if you have any questions for us, just put them in the chat and we'll get back to you later. So let us just keep on going. As I said, we're a Native American government nonprofit. We started as a community group and got our IRS determination in 2013. Um, and I keep on mentioning, you know, our mission is sustainable and just local food system. So we're working both on environmental and social sustainability at the same time, and um, really looking at those core um, underlying issues around um, food justice and social justice when we come to the food systems work. Um, so we do education around food. A lot of that is what we do. Um, and you'll see throughout the pr presentation, we'll talk about it. Um, we also specialize in revitalizing um, traditional dawn autumn crops and agriculture, so agricultural techniques, but also culture that comes around with it, including eating crops. Um, and then we um, do several things to work on removing barrier to access. I mentioned before we are a food desert, um, but there are many other barriers to access to healthy and culturally appropriate foods. And lastly, we, um, we foster economic development um, because as I will keep on talking, is food is power. Food is power and that has been always clear to us. And it's not just that choice of, or power of choice when we decide we'll have you know, a soda or a mint tea. It's not just that immediate, it is, um, you know, how we spend our money, how we, um, who we support, support in the community, all those things of food system um, working. And, you know, we want to give you an insight of how it works in the native communities. Um, so 
I'm sure you have heard in a lot of talks, um, there's always this constant talk about this empowerment of native communities. So we're saying, you know, food is a very tangible way to claim our power back. And um, we often say, um, nobody will do it for us, right? There is nobody coming to save us. We are at the end of the world or in the middle of nowhere, and it is up to us to do something. Um, and when we do programs or um, anything we do, the vision, you know, and this is where I'm really grateful to our board um, and Dion is on our board too. The vision is, and I'm sorry, Dion, I'm going to quote you here. You know, Dion, Dion has been, um, has often said when we sit down and kind of try to crack hard nuts, she says, you know, this is my community. I don't have another community to go to. So whatever we do, <laughs> You know, it's going to stay for, uh, for forever here. It's going to stay with us. And, you know, that idea, we don't have another commu community to go to and really working for the people we know and live with and, you know, will die with. Um, so we'll keep on returning to that um, theme often here too, because um, as I said, we want to, you know, maybe some theory and you might have experienced food system organizing elsewhere, but here our um, core values are really down to the people and down to the community and culture. We do believe it's about elders and youth and oftentimes we try to connect the um, both, you know, they have the answers. Elders teach us, um, when I first came here, the reason I learned about this, I even got involved in this work was because an elder asked me to help the youth here in Ajo. And then um, an, another elder taught me, spent days and weeks and months with me teaching me how to, um, how to grow foods, how to grow traditional crops, how to take care of them, how to prepare them. And, um, you know, um, I carry that knowledge forward. And when I asked him, why me? You know, I'm from Slovenia. I'm not going to stay here. That was 13 years ago. He was like, you're the only one who shows up. So knowledge is responsibility. And we know that. And um, but it's the youth who has the vision for the future that will be the one who are doing the future too. So a lot of our programming has to do with the youth, including the interns Dion has at the cafe or um, interns that Sterling works with in the gardens. I keep on talking about power and we really think hard about how our programs or services or whatever we do is not, you know, providing services, you get a grant, you do it for three years and then you disappear. It's more really trying to build up that capacity in the people. We all believe that people want to make it work. They want to make good lives for themselves. And we really think hard, you know, like our job is just to provide them tools or open some um, avenues they might have not had before. Our job is not to save anyone, you know, we can barely, you know, do our own personal lives. It's more like, you know, whatever we can is about creating spaces where people can then come and help themselves. And um, in all we do, um, you know, we are always in relationships with each other with the land, with the people, um, with the other people and plants and animals. Um, it's kind of that holistic approach for those of you who are um, versed in permaculture or um, um, other indigenous systems, you know, it's a very common principle that whatever you do think about the effects it will have not only in short term and on you, but other elements that we share this world with. And it's all about circles and cycles to complete these organizing principles. And you know, the way our board meetings look is like ours and the way our staff meeting looks like it's ours because in everything we do, we try to, to think about this and it's circles and cycles, you know, nothing stays the same. Being farmers, things change with the seasons all the time. Um, we know change is a constant, but we also know, you know, we try to go with it, but also enrich it. I don't want to say direct it, but enrich it. And we know that things come back in one way or another. People come back in one way or another. And again, being a farmer, we're always, you know, planting for the next season while we're still tending, you know, the plants we planted in the previous season. So with that, um, 
you know, that's maybe already a little bit different approach to programming in a food system work that you might have heard before. Another big, um, a big important um, kind of marker for us is understanding the history of the dawn autumn and the historical changes that happened on the reservation. And unfortunately, I cannot enlarge this for you all, but um, just very briefly, the way this looks is, um, you know, the dawn autumn have been here for, according to the oral history, for thousands of years, and the archaeological data supports that as well. And um, there have been some major disruptions, of course, throughout this time. And the food systems work we encounter now, kind of major interruptions or disruptions had to do with the arrival of the Spanish in the end of the 17th century, the Spanish missionaries, which brought different cultural techniques as well as cultivars, the plants, um, including the pomegranates or wheat and wheat. Um, so that's kind of a big disruption. And, you know, we always say plants travel, people travel. So that's, but that it did change the way the um, food work has been done here and how people grew plants and how people traded and ate. The other major disruption, um, which was happening kind of at the, the end of the 19th century to about the um, kind of 1970s um, of the 20th century are the boarding schools. And I'm sure in the last few weeks you have heard about um, the Canadian boarding school system and about 219 kids that were found um, um, dead, uh, little bodies they found. So that's a big trauma um, and it's important to understand um, that that was happening and that just about anybody we encounter in the community is carrying results of that trauma. Um, we are talking about the Donna Autumn who were known as farmers or bean eaters, Papagov, bastardized name for Donna Autumn is the bean eaters in Spanish. Um, they were known farmers and with the boarding school and being forced for the kids to leave their families and communities and family fields, literally, and spend a year away from the family and then several other years. Um, what happened was the agricultural practices practically died. Um, you know, we talked about food memories at the beginning and several of you remembered, you know, occasions where people came together and shared the food and learned how to do it together or did it together. So what happens to a nation or a tribe in our case where the kids are taken away and they cannot plant a field with their grandma, they cannot cook, um, cook the food with their mom, they cannot go out and harvest what foods with their grandpa. What happens with the nation, what happens with the culture. And when um, the revit revitalization of this uh, work of traditional Dawn Autumn food system started in the early 2000s with Dawn Autumn Community Action that was founded by Terrell Johnson and Tristan Reeder, um, you know, by then, and I came to that uh, to this area in 2006 and was trying to do some interviews with um, people about traditional agriculture. Um, people lost the practices. You're talking about the loss of traditional practices for two to three generations. So what, you know, now think about, you know, think about that. If you didn't know how to make all your favorite family meals because you never spent the time with your family because you were away. So that's the trauma and it goes into, you know, it goes into poverty issues, it goes into abuse issues, um, physical abuse, um, substance abuse, there's a lot of things that this cost. So it's just important to understand why, you know, why we're so much about people and empowerment. And then there were some other things that came with the, um, um, you know, establishment of the reservation, um, interruption to the two village lifestyle. Um, but all of that, um, I, I'm going to skip the one slide and I'll um, just show you the traditional Donald Autumn food system. Now this is an idealized, I would say, look back. Um, and um, you know, the Donald Autumn in that desert land that I showed you and beyond, because this is just the size of the reservation, which is the second largest reservation in the lower 48 states. 
the dawn autumn used to travel or the autumn used to travel from the um, um, Sea of Cortez all the way almost to the Flagstaff to the Hopi area and um, all the way to the Eastern Arizona and all the way to Yuma. And the food systems comprised of the trading routes because when people move, they take food with them. So the salt from the sea, the venison from the north, you know, people move. A big part of the traditional food system was ryland farming and Sterling will probably touch on that a little bit later. Wild plant harvesting actually consisted of the majority of their food system. Um, we, we right now are looking at the saguaro fruit um, um, ripening. The saguaro fruit harvest is coming up. Big important food source as well as connected to many ceremonies. Um, this is the traditional time of a new year for the town autumn um, and um, ce celebrating it with abundant harvest as well as making a wine. And there are then wine ceremonies that also connect to um, calling the rains. There's much more behind all of this, um, but then um, the um, fourth element of the traditional Thon Autumn food system is hunting, um, um, small game all the way to deer and bighorn. So if that was kind of a past, um, you know, how, how do we go about revitalizing it, right? So I'm gonna turn it now to Sterling and he'll talk about some of the things we do. Um, but before you start, can you please introduce yourself and share your um, favorite food memory? Okay. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Sterling Thompson. I work with the CSA. I'm the farm manager and mentor for uh, for our um, for CSA. So, uh, and then food memory. Hmm. Right now, uh, it would have to be uh, the sour fruit or by the uh, no, something that no, as no, I grown up uh, harvesting, especially uh, during the summer when they had uh, a whole day. Um, at the ranch, I would uh, go out, take a horse, and go find the lowest one, lowest arm, and then uh, either stand up on the stirrups or stand up on the saddle and pick. Um, and that was probably one of my favorite things about the summer because it was something that uh, for most people uh, in Arizona, uh, inter, um, universities, um, graduates, um, I'll get out in the, in the middle of May and high school and elementary, all the schools get out at, at the end of June, or at the end of May, beginning of June. So I mean, it's almost right around that time. Uh, and so no, it always reminds me of uh, beginning of the summer. So, uh, with to, uh, today, you know, uh, talking about a lot of things, uh, talking about you know, what this uh, sovereignty means to us um, as authors, you know, and wondering, you know, uh, um, there's no word, there's uh, being a speaker. No, uh, it's really it's really difficult to translate uh, things in English because you know in English things did mean different things um, and and different meanings and in autumn it's very um, simple and straightforward but um, even that's hard too because it's you know. There's a lot of things in English that can be expressed in all of them. So, you no, know, understanding that, yeah, in the early, you know, um, you know 1600s and you know, all the way to 900s, you know, autumn's always, you know, 
were able to take care of themselves, um, grow the food, um, uh, grow the traditional foods, uh, while harvesting and hunting, and all those were the things. And those are the things that I did uh, growing up. No, I didn't. I grew up with the. I grew up on a ranch with no running water and no electricity, and our place didn't get electricity electricity till two thousand eight. So, I've been growing up with electricity for generations. No, no, that's no. And people just say, well, it's always been in our lives. But for me, it wasn't. I grew up with kerosene lamps and uh, having to go run out to the horses and get, you know, catch the horses, bring them in, run up foot. Uh, a lot of hard labor work that you know, has taken care of me. And no, now, now, now things are changing. You know, a lot of things are are coming uh, our way that you know, we're being more aware of now as a nation, uh, as a community, and as you know, we, as us, you say, you know, wanting to preserve and, and, and think ahead of what, what will happen for the future. Uh, you guys see here, you know, you know what we need to invest into our people, uh, especially youth. You know, that's always been, you know, it's just not a, something that, uh, as a Native thing, it's always been you know, everyone's thing. You know. People, you know, our parents, you know, our grandparents, or, you know, or even ourselves, you know, being parents, we always have thought about what, what will it be for the future? You know, what would he have done different? What would he have done you know, that you know, what could translate? And that's all we're doing is translating you know, metaphorically, spiritually, and, and literally. Uh, you know, translating, you know, because it was a different time. You know, I grew up with you know, something that's you know, the 1900s, you know, thinking, you know, work, and you know, not having a lot of you know, what we used to call distractions, you know, TV, games, you know, video games, I'd be more specific. You know, it's always, you know, what, what can you do in a day? And if you set your mind to it, there's a lot that can happen in a day. And it made it made you, you know work hard. It made you appreciate what was in front of you, and also you know it made you think about a lot of things in this life. There's been a lot, and now I'm at the age where okay, um, what I learned, what I want to pass on to the next generation. You know, um, that's why you know I'm still here in the home. Uh, I grew up doing this work with kids. You know, uh, for 25 years, I've been working with youth for 25 years. Um, it's been a really you know, unique thing, especially you know, coming from my background, being a, uh, a rodeo person. Going to rodeos over the weekend, uh, riding uh, riding bulls. Uh, that was my event. Was bull riding, and I was good at it. Um, I was good at it. Um, um, and now um, coming home and during the week, you know, it was school in the ranch, nothing else. You know, and you know, it really made me think. So, you know. Now that we live in this modern age where every, you know, you know, technology, you know, people have iPods, people have you know, cell phones, you know, I didn't, you know, those are things that people are around now. And it's so different. You know, how do you translate that? How do you communicate? You know, 
how do you communicate what you have learned and what, you know, how do you keep moving forward? How do we continue to, you know, invest in the future? Um, you know, no, I'm really grateful that I got to work with, you know, I get to work with the school here in Ajo, um, which I get to sh share a little portion of what the Ajo culture is, you know, from the traditions, uh, to some of the practices, uh, but that, that's just a tip, you know, that, you know, or that's just, you know, that, that's barely, you know, not even touching the surface. You know. It's just things that you, know, you can see, but you know, to feel and to actually do these things is a lot different. And those are the ones that I, you know, I get to, um, connect with, you know, and I also get to go to the BIA school on the reservation too as well. So Donna Autumn High School, which is another school I just got to, uh, been working with for the last three years. Uh, connecting them to uh, these practices, you know, these, you know, name I mentioned before, not, not being able to uh, practice what, what was you know, always here, you know, the, you know, the food, you know, the tipper beans, the corn, the squash, uh, the watermelons, all these things that, I, that we never got to, you know, that I never got to do uh, growing up. And, you know, agriculture is still going to be, it's still going to be something that we're going to have to think about for the future. Um, especially when you know, uh, here in Arizona, everything's being developed. Um, there's a lot of farmlands that I used to see are no longer there. Um, and coming from the rodeo background, I know, know hay need, uh, there's hay, the horses need hay. And I knew if I got the best hay, the horses did the best. Um, but no, those who no grow the food, no, being a farmer and seeing the, the other side, um, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of um, hands on learning that you know, people are, you know, people have found interest in more. So by going to the school, you know, getting the kids interested in growing their own food. Uh, whether they just choose to, as a career or whether they you know, find you know, wellness and that, um, health or mental, uh, those are the kind of things, even you know, cultural well, uh, well, wellness, you now tying it to the culture, you know, telling them how much, because you know, you know, some of the traditional foods or the traditional crops have you know, legends or stories that tie us you know, to them. Uh, as part of that, you know, doing the summer in internship, you know, having, be able to uh, work with a group of young kids um, or young adults sometimes um, and showing them and having them experiences by, um, uh, for themselves, you know, right here on um, the, right, the right side, you know, that was, you know, the traditional 60-day corn and, Know, teaching you know, this young man next to me how to you know, roast the corn, you know, that's something that I never, um, you know, I never thought I'd be doing. You know. And, you know, that led me to you know, the uh, apprenticeship. Um, and thinking about the apprenticeship and I wanted to, de to um, train new farmers train new farmers and also connect to people, uh, connect to resources and, and to uh, make this available to everyone. You, know, you see this posters that here, um, these posters you know, that helped us connect to a lot of people you know, that are interested in growing the food, who are interested in uh, learning whether it's uh, whether it's hands-on with the apprenticeship program that we run um, with uh, Maho CSA and, and me being the mentor or Nolan Johnson, 
being a dryland farmer, uh, these are um, uh, these are things that people can learn, and uh, also TOC, TOCC the, uh, to learn the uh, to learn the, the non-native way, which is uh, the science and the uh, and how it connects, and wanting to expand on that, um, wanting to grow on top of that. Now these all these all these things are good. And, uh, it's wonderful that you know, all of us get to you know, connect to different uh, to different groups and bring in new people to you know, take over because you no, know, I didn't know about traditional foods. I didn't know about tepid beans. I didn't know about um, sixty day corn or anything like that. All I all I knew all I cared about was going to the rodeos and being the best and coming home and. and Making sure I was healthy enough to go to the next one, and no, I no. So knowing that I my journey, no, where I started, no, where I started, and how food has no changed my life, no, and seeing no, being able to learn from farmers, learn from no, uh, learn from them. You know, absorb that you know, knowledge and to be able to you know, teach it or translate it to the next generation. You know, because some of these guys weren't, you know, some of these things weren't around when I was around. But now that they are, you know, we're doing our best to continue to expand on it. And part of our thing is the making a policy change. Um, the SB 150 and the S uh, HB. Uh, 2142 uh, uh, are us you know, making this connection on a bigger scale because we want to be able to you know, to um, give that knowledge and give that experience to the next farmers because the average age of a farmer in Arizona is 65 years old. And you uh, know, I did about farming, it's a lot of hard work and it's not for the whole. And you no, know, but they have their place. You no, know, the older generation has its place in being able to share that knowledge with the younger generation to learn and to be better. And you know, now that you no, know, there's a lot of things that are going on you know, now, whether it's you know, permaculture or or organic you know, growing or you know, sustainable growing. There's all these things that are going on that people have access to. Um, and people are doing this on a small scale and a big scale. And by making these changes for Arizona to make this available for the, the next generation of farmers uh, in Arizona, it's just gonna make these things a lot more better. And to be better growers and to be better caretakers of the land. And, you know, Still, you know, our thing has always uh, has always been to grow uh, food that are that are uh, that are from here, uh, and we give out uh, seeds through our Adopt the Snow Crop uh, Crop Program, and we give out these seeds, especially the traditional seeds, because uh, we want people to understand that uh, these things can grow. In these climates, when it's 100, 110, 115, and they will survive. And the, you know, and to get people to understand that you know, these are foods that you know, are here. You know, we always wanted to make it so that uh, you know, I didn't grow with temporary beans, but when I was younger, and it was always during the worst time of, of any family's life is when someone, an elderly would die or pass on. And the only time that I remember seeing temporary beats is when our, our, our elders would pass. And that was the only time I saw temporary beats. You know? And you know, it was usually a stew or a soup. 
but I wouldn't see those any time any time else. Uh, those were the things that were really. Uh, well, once I started learning how to grow food and uh, learning about traditional foods and traditional practices like the dry farming, uh, it made me appreciate more of my uh, of who I am and where I come from because uh, uh, these people, uh, this these uh, these people, or the Alton people, the the old ones, uh, they did this you know, without any machinery or without any uh, modern technology. They just did it by uh, film and learn, watch, uh, uh, really watch their um, surroundings and become better farmers, become you know, better growers. And, you know, and some of our villages are named after. Um, of certain things that were grown or are are able or were able to uh, manage fields very well and be able to grow this fruit uh, on a good uh, growing good just for uh, for the community and grow uh, uh, for the future uh, because uh, the seeds uh, do carry things from uh, carry seed carry carry your disease, the genetics, you know, carry um, things from the past and they are able to withstand withstand the future. And as long as we're still growing them, they will withstand the future. But uh, if no one's there to grow them, and there's no one that knows how to grow them, they will no longer survive. So um, as you now growing up you know, and expanding on the culture and the traditions, and uh, getting people to understand uh, now, now I can go outside, talk about sovereignty on the outside of the world, outside the reservation or the nation, um, outside, and people will understand, but you know, for us, you know, these things are always here, you know, um, and it's through working with the communities, working with uh, the next generations, both on and off the reservation, that we continue to uh, make better communications and translate um, those things that um, um, that sovereignty you know, a lot better, so that people can you know, who decides to carry this on for the next generation will have a better you know, understanding. Will make things better. And, Continue to make do, uh, continue to grow in, in this ways, and as farmers, as people of, you know, of this earth, you know, we are just always doing our best to make things better. So, so, so thank you, Sterling. So I'll uh, turn it now to Dion. And Dion, um, can you please, before we go into the cafe and all the things you do there, can you maybe introduce yourself and um, share your food memory with us? Um, hi, everyone. Um, so happy and honored to be here. But um, my name is Dion Vega. I am born and raised in Ajo. Um, and my food memory, um, being that the monsoons just, or the monsoon season, excuse me, just started, um, one of my food memories is um, going out to the desert and harvesting verdolagas with my dad and my grandpa, which is purslane. Um, it grows abundantly out in desert, um, especially near these like natural water holes that we have kind of out in this area. Um, and yeah, that's, one of the, one of my best memories, I think, growing up is going out into the desert area and harvesting the purslane and coming home and watching my dad and my grandpa clean it out and then my, watching my grandma prepare it. Um, it's still to this day one of my favorite foods and something that I look forward to every year during this time. Um, so getting into, I guess, my work with the Ajo CSA, um, 
um, I guess my role here as, as, as a cook, as someone who's a cooking enthusiast or like a foodie, I guess you'd call me, is to transform these ingredients into something that's a little bit more modern. Um, because as Sterling said, and, and Nina mentioned, um, and I didn't realize this growing up. I don't know. This was just something I grew up with. Um, I guess I get a little bit going back a little bit. Um, some of my history is my dad, my grandpa was Otam from Kitovac on the Mexican side of the Otam Ration. Um, and so again, I grew up harvesting. I grew up watching them hunt. You know, I would learn to respect the land and the animals. I was always told you don't kill anything that you're not gonna eat. You don't harvest anything you're gonna eat. You don't waste food. Um, food is sacred, food is special. And so, um, that's what I try to do with these native crops. And my great passion in this organization is to make sure that these native foods live on onto next generations. And again, that they get passed on to the younger generation. Um, as Nina mentioned, knowledge is responsibility. And I feel like it is our responsibility, not just so that the kids don't know where the food is coming from, but how to prepare it. Um, because there's no use in knowing how to grow it and harvest it if you don't know what to do with it. Um, so, um, what's my train of thought? Um, so again, my, my passion again is to take these ingredients and make them more modern. Uh, Sterling and Nina mentioned, we are kind of landlocked in Ajo, there's nowhere to go. People go out and to the city and once they're there, they buy, um, fast food and other kinds of foods. And so nobody really wants to come home and eat a boiled bean as they were traditionally known. Um, tra traditional recipes are absolutely important to pass on. Um, but I think in this modern day, it is important that we learn how to kind of transform them. And that is again, my great passion. Um, I didn't honestly didn't know that I was doing this up until Nina uh, kind of sought me out and said, you know, what you're doing is so important. And so I was, was brought in um, to do this. And uh, we, that's something that we, our goal um, is to offer these foods at the Ajo Farmer's Market um, and Cafe. Um, we do have the native ingredients there that can be purchased. Um, because of the pandemic, our goal has kind of slowed down or our dream has kind of been put on the back burner and we've really tailored to um, traffic that's passing through to Rocky Point and to the locals um, but once we are freed up and, and things start to get better we will definitely start to evolve our menu into a more native only menu with these with these products and to really start programs to get kids involved with their food um, because once the kids are involved with the food they know where it comes from they know how to prepare it so then they're most likely to taste it or take it home and talk about it um, and teach people in their homes um, and if they're not teaching them, they're at least making them curious about it and maybe they come out and seek it out but um, Anyways, that, that is my role with the uh, CSA. Um, and I just, I, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the tepary bean. We have some here. These are dried tepary beans. These are the ones that Sterling grows. Um, there's different varieties of them. There's brown, there's white, there's black. And these are my absolute favorite to work with. I've transformed these into many of things from ice cream to macaroni and cheese. And though they're not the healthiest of foods, they are a much healthier version of what is out there. Um, these are very, very um, nutrient rich, very protein packed, um, a little glycemic index, which is great for the people on the nation because of like Nina mentioned of the high rates of obesity and uh, diabetes. Um, so we just want to make sure that people learn of these native foods and that they incorporate them back into their diets um, to try and get the, the people healthier again. Um, my latest 
And one of my favorites is um, using the, the white tepary beans. So you cook this down. Um, we cook these in an Instapot for about an hour and a half or so. Um, and once they're cooked, I make them into a tepary bean a la fresca, which is here. And of course, yes, there is sugar in here, but it is only the tepary bean and milk and sugar and some cinnamon as opposed to it being made with rice. So it's kind of like a norchata, um, which is much healthier. Again, you're getting a lot of proteins and it is a low glycemic index. Um, so that is my role with the AHO CSA. Um, again, um, Oh, here's a slide showing you the, some of the salads that we work with. We do work with other Native American ingredients. We work with the chillum, with the choy buds and the tepary beans. Um, we do tepary bean uh, quesadillas. We do the choy bud egg quesadillas. Um, and like I said, once the pandemic kind of eases up on us, we will get more people in and train them to teach them how to cook these native ingredients and evolve our menu into a more native. And as Nina mentioned, we have Lucia here, who is a local uh, chef and who um, offers her tamales. And, and we always try to support local chefs um, and uh, support regional foods, um, which again is, is super important to me and super important to the organization that Ajo's culture um, remains intact. Um, I feel like Ajo is evolving so much with um, tourism and, and other things going on. And it, it's our job or my passion to make sure that the cultures in Ajo, um, especially the food cultures in Ajo remain alive and well, because it's, it's through food that our, our culture survive and thrive. So, um, that's, uh, you can see here in the background, um, our Native American ingredients. They are, again, for sale. There is an online store um, that you can order and that they'll be shipped out to. And, and in our refrigerators here, we try to keep local uh, favorites and, and local chefs um, food for sale. So that that is my role. <laughs> Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Sterling. Um, so um, I'll just finish us off and I hope you have lots of questions and um, both of um, Sterling and Dion have so much more to say. But um, um, yeah, you see here on the photo on the right, we work with, um, we have about 20 vendors right now post pandemic in the cafe. And as Dion mentioned, we really got sidetracked with the pandemic, um, but you can buy unique jewelry, um, unique Dawn Autumn jewelry, baskets, and other products in our um, physical physical location in Ajo. And based on the experience we learned um, about organizing, um, how do you organize a community and how do you give people a hand up um, and helping businesses thrive through the years in Ajo, we incubated and helped over hundred businesses, which is incredible for this small community. And we are bringing that experience to um, organizing the autumn farmer's market. Unfortunately, um, we were in the midst of intensive planning when the pandemic hit. So a lot of our events got transferred online. And to this day, the, um, um, the social gatherings are prohibited on the Dawn Autumn Nation. So we cannot hold the markets in um, person. And I know in Tucson and Phoenix, farmers markets have been alive and well, and everybody's been doing really well because people have been actually seeking out more of the um, local healthier crops. But um, for the tribal communities that got hit really, really hard with COVID. And uh, um, you know we respect the chairman of the Don Autumn Nation wanting to keep it safe and continues to prohibit all social gatherings. So we keep on doing um, virtual markets. In fact, our next one is coming up on um, Wednesday, June 23rd. 
Um, and you can join us um, on that. We are on Facebook and you'll get a link there. It's of course free, but you get to meet the vendors and you can purchase directly from them. In the last present, in the last market, Terrell Johnson is the one who runs this market for us. And he always introduces unique basket weavers, like for example, um, uh, Rose, Rose um, Martin made this beautiful basket, which um, it's really dear to me because it's flowers and butterflies and it uses, um, you know, unique um, red yucca um, on top of the um, um, devil's claw and the regular yucca and bear grass. So um, beautiful, beautiful items, very nice storytelling event. So if you can join us, please do. Um, and then, as Dion mentioned, we do have an online store and um, ahocommercemarketcafe.com. And then we also are preparing an autumn, um, an autumn farmer's market store um, that you will be able to shop. So I'll finish us off with, um, you know, what Dion also mentioned, the restaurant, um, she was opening it up and we were doing good until the pandemic came and um, we'll, if you remember the first few slides of the presentation, Aho and Ton Autumn Nation are very much far away. You know, it's not like um, there's a lot of stores um, or any other access um, or any other food options. And when the pandemic hit in March, the shelves emptied out both in Aho and on the Ton Autumn Nation. And this is not like oh, Safeway next to my house doesn't have something, I'll just go one block further to fries and get it. This is like, okay, there's no food here, like literally no food. I have to drive for an hour and a half or even more to get it. Um, so we um, start, uh, pulled together local and regional partners, especially local food system here came to play because um, you know, everybody, emergency food system collapsed. Um, the stores, big warehouses, Costco was selling like one can of tuna, um, if they even had it. And we really utilized local farmers like Rooted Sky Farms. We worked with this Kashita Refugee Network in Tucson and started pulling together this massive amounts of food. Um, we are, um, actually this was April, um, a year count. We are over a million pounds of food that we aggregated and distributed to over 2000 families both in Ajo and on the seven districts of the Don Autumn Nation, all the Western districts, kind of central Don Autumn Nation, all the way to us. Um, we fed people and kudos to everybody who made this work. Um, the interns that we talked about before, the young people stepped up and do, did this. And in fact, today, this afternoon, while we're here doing this presentation, we're having our monthly um, distribution still because um, the pandemic might be slowing down, but it did reveal a lot of food issues, food um, insecurity issues, and really deeply rooted poverty issues. And as the rest of Arizona might be, or the urban Arizona might be rebouncing, um, the rural and tribal communities continue to struggle and unfortunately will probably continue to struggle for a long time, which brings me back to, you know, we're gonna continue to do our work and, um, you know, empowering people from youth to um, businesses to elders and keep on connecting us. So um, with that, um, you know, um, I, this is my personal no, thank you, but it's really with everyone. Food is power and, um, you know, it connects us to who we, we are, where we are and the work we do. So um, I'm gonna stop here and I hope we got you thinking of, about a few things. Maybe there are some questions, Miss Lisa. Yes, go ahead and stop sharing your slides and we'll do some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I know some because I've been following you on Instagram and Facebook, but I learned a lot. Um, so we I have um, several questions here and I'm looking also I made some notes myself. I was wondering um, when the cafe is open, if somebody is going out to Ajo or driving to Rocky Point, if they could stop in and get a meal and, and is it on the plaza? You want to answer that? Yeah. yeah, so we are located in the plaza, which is known as a historical uh, district here in Ajo. Um, we are right on 85, just what would it be east of or south of the bank, just 
the only stoplight we have in our home. But yes, we are open Monday through Friday as of right now um, from 10 o'clock in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon. So yes, absolutely, please come visit us. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. And I did put in the chat the link to the online Aho Market and Cafe. So you all can hop over there and visit it. Um, but do follow them on Facebook and Instagram to find out about events coming up. I think, um, Nina, isn't there, is that you that's sponsoring the saguaro harvesting one with Terrell that's coming up? Mm -hmm. Do you want to mention that? Thank you. I'm sorry. We have so much going on all the time. We hosted a workshop on the cooperatives today already. And tomorrow during lunchtime, 12 to 1, Terrell Johnson, um, our mentor and a food activist and a world-renowned basket weaver is doing a presentation on saguaro fruit harvesting. Um, so please join us. Um, if you just go on our Facebook page, all of the events and links are there. Um, as well. And that's, of course, a free event as well. And then on Thursday and Friday, we have the um, a workshop with um, Sterling's Apprentices um, doing the sticks for saguaro fruit harvest. Um, and we are harvesting. Um, we're starting to harvest next week um, to make um, some products and show people how to do that because it is an economic opportunity, at least for some of the folks out here. But um, because of the Dawn Autumn Nation, um, actually the chair um, just released um, um, the um, proclamation, I think on Friday that social gatherings are prohibited. It seems like we're not gonna have our regular saguaro fruit camp, not this year. Oh, that's hard. Um, could you, what is the name of the Facebook page? So it's Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture. And I have some questions. So um, Lindsay wanted to know, how can those who live in other parts of the state support your community and efforts? Oh, wow. Um, um, well, maybe, maybe I can start and maybe the guys can think about it too. Um, the, first of all, I would say, you know, bloom where you are planted and um, go and support your local farmers. Um, remember you are always on some tribal land um, and the Native Americans are alive and well and they're all around you. So I would actually encourage you to get to know your tribal, uh, um, tribal people, your tribal neighbors, the history of your land, the history of your place. Then to work directly with us, we always look for volunteers, either for our food relief program or all the farming um, things that we're doing. The, what's coming up, certainly didn't get to mention much, is our monsoon planting season. We have, um, we work with several farmers, helping them plant and um, with our apprenticeship program and we have our own dryland farms. So we would always love for you to come and lend us a hand. Um, then there are all these workshops coming up. Um, we organize native food-based gathering. I think Sterling, you're wearing a shirt from our winter one. That's always a good time. It's virtual right now and the summer one will be hosted probably in August. So um, that way, and of course we always accept donations if you want to contribute um, just monetarily, that's always very welcome as well. And we have a link on our website and our, uh, on our Facebook page for donations. But we invite you, come and join us. Come, come, come share you know, food with us. Thanks. And talking about supporting you, if somebody would like um, to know a little bit more, Sterling, and if you could come closer to the mic when you speak, it would be helpful, um, about those bills that you mentioned that are, they wanted to know if you could clarify what those are. Uh, so that uh, that bill, both bills are in support of having Arizona um, pay for uh, help pay for um, apprenticeship uh, programs. Uh, so if you want to be a plumber, there's uh, the state will pay for it. To you, for you to be a plumber, a carpenter, an electrician, no, because those those, those are are no needed uh, or most requested jobs, uh, and the state will pay for it. But as far as farming, no, Arizona is a twenty four billion dollar 
farming industry, but there's no money to to um, that that's allocated to teach about farming, especially in Arizona. Uh, Arizona is very different. I say we're either in the best place or the worst place to grow food because we can grow year round. We can, uh, for us, uh, during the summer, today, the record's like 110, 112 today. And uh, I just went to go uh, check our uh, our two urban uh, plots and they're growing, we're growing uh, traditional uh, squash, we're growing traditional beans, we're growing traditional corn, and it's all surviving. It's not wilted, it's not, um, actually hopefully by the end of this week, I'll have some uh, the traditional Donna Optum 60 day corn. Um, but, and then during the fall and winter, we're getting ready to plant uh, uh, what uh, most people call summer crops. So lettuce, arugula, broccoli, kale, uh, watermelon, tomatoes, chilies, uh, all that's being planted. And um, for most of the people that live in colder country, or colder countries, now that's that's all being planted right about now. Uh, for us, that's early spring, now which is February. Uh, summer for us is traditional foods. Fall is now, now lettuce, kale, broccoli, arugula, uh, uh, cilantro, I mean, parsley, onions. No, there's a whole lot of things that we can grow during the fall and then in the winter, into the winter. And it's uh, it's a really unique thing that happens here. Uh, we don't get snow, so we don't have to worry about snow and all the, all the other stuff. So, uh, but with the two bills that are being looked in uh, and at the state capitol, uh, those are just uh, there to help um, the farmers uh, get people who are interested in an apprenticeship program and be able to pay for it. So. I have a little update on that, um, Lisa. Um, so this is our third um, third year around that we've been working with um, other agencies um, who were um, who are like lobbyists, and we're basically raising awareness around um, state of um, agriculture and beginning farmers in Arizona. So we really the way to get involved is get educated about it, you know, know where your food comes from, know, you know, there are barriers to access into farming that go beyond just access to land and water. Really what Sterling was describing is very unique growing conditions and it takes working with somebody else to learn. That's how we learned. That's how we, both of us learned. And you don't, you know, I'm super like a bookworm um, and you cannot learn agriculture from books. So we are bringing the best practices from an apprenticeship program we have run for many years now to um, really um, advocate for the state of Arizona to um, you know, accept and um, pass agriculture as a workforce development program. And currently the third year around, we're hoping um, it will be included in the budget. We're looking good right now, but um, if it, there is a need, um, you can always follow up. We do ask for people to contact their um, representatives to support it. Right now we're hoping, we're looking really good, um, but please continue to educate yourself. Thank you. And the next questions all deal with the cafe and recipes, but I have one for Sterling real quickly. Um, Sterling, you mentioned other times of year is what we plant, but as we go into the monsoon season now, isn't that another planting time? And if so, what do you plant? Oh, uh, so that's the food I'm currently talking about. It's the traditional food. So the temporary uh, so beans, right? Temporary beans, corn, squash, and you know, all those can grow. You know, it's very, uh, it's hot, but those things grow, especially, um, especially now because you know I seen temporary beans grow go without water for almost a month and a half. Wow! And when temperatures are still in the hundreds, so uh, these these are crops and um, seeds do take uh, take the um, the environment into their. Um, they're, they're genetic. So if it's a dry or hot you know, year, 
Now, and then those seeds produce, or the, you plant it and it grows and it produces, and you save the seeds, those seeds will actually have that genetic gene in them to you know, withstand the heat. So you have, you're doing seed saving out there as well. As well too, as well. It's, it's something that we practice and it's, and we give out to people and the, those who, and we encourage people to grow them and to uh, know about them and um, save their seeds because no, no, not one location can grow all the seeds for everyone. No, if you're in a high desert, and you're trying to give it out to people in the low desert, that's not going to survive, no. And there's times where people have you no know, lost a lot of lost their seeds because you no, know, they grew them in high deserts or uh, grew them towards the end of the season or the beginning of the seasons, and not to you no, know, and then having a piece of paper saying, "Oh, it grows around this time," and then uh, we have people being discouraged because or being impatient because uh, sometimes these seeds do take a long time uh, to produce and not having that patience to wait for them. But all in all, we do, um, this is something that we've done with the school here uh, for um, pre-K to sixth grade and now uh, high, uh, nine to 12 is teaching about seed saving and we have done the same thing on the BIA school on the Don Austin High School, so. Great, and so we do give out seeds. Yeah. So if anybody wants to get seeds, um, we this is a free program too, and they come out. Um, they, they, you can get um, directions as well how to take care of them. So if you need any of the traditional seeds, and most of our seeds are grown in dryland conditions in order to continue their resiliency and being able to thrive in 110 plus degrees. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. So now we're gonna to turn to already grown food. People would like to know if you considered um, teaching any of the, the cooking skills for using these traditional foods and also um, is it where somebody could find the recipe for the foods. Okay, um, yes, but that's something that we definitely plan here for the future again as the pandemic gets better and we're able to gather Again, um, it's something that we are working on right now um, and trying to build and, and design is um, even online cooking classes, maybe through YouTube or maybe through some other type of social platform. Um, but yes, cooking classes are definitely in the works. Um, as far as recipes, I haven't <laughs> put them down anywhere other than I have a personal Instagram um, that I have some traditional foods on um that I, i've made i haven't shared any of the recipes but that's definitely in the works um we do want to get these down on paper and and some type of of cookbook possibly um to go along with the cooking class so that's definitely in the works nina do you know if the cookbook that toka did the is that book still available so from the Itoy garden we refer to it here as the bible um, right. <laughs> um, so um, we usually carry a few copies at the cafe, um, um, but otherwise it's per order. You can just buy it from Amazon. You have right. to order. We usually order a few at the beginning of each season. Um, so it is still around. And as Dion mentioned, yeah, um, we are trying to pull together a few recipes and share. So if you come to any of our events, usually, you know, we pass out um, recipe cards. Um, there are recipe cards available at the cafe too. When you come and purchase any of the things, um, any of the traditional crops, you, you're also free to take the recipe cards with you. So that is coming up. Um, as I said, the pandemic really, and Dion mentioned it too, right. really, really hindered a lot of these things because our food hub turned into an emergency food um, hub. No. Uh, very important work. I know also at San Javier Farm Co-op, if you buy chicory beans from them, they have recipes that they'll give you with the beans when you buy them, um, how to make them. But you can cook them any way you make regular beans or chickpeas, right? I don't know. Do you want to give us any hints, Dion? Get people started and then we're going to close off for the evening after that. I'm sorry, can you, what was the question? Is any hints for people who want to start experimenting cooking with tepary beans? Yeah, the tepary bean is so, so versatile. I've used it again for many things, from making ice cream to um, making mac and cheese. Um, 
Unfortunately, like I don't have any flashcards. The only thing I can do is show it off of my phone. I do have a personal Instagram where again, I do show some um, foods that I've made using native ingredients, mostly tapery beans. Um, you'll see some purslane on there as well. My Instagram handle, if anybody wants to go on there and look is at Dion. So it's D-I-O-N. VG, so Victor Golf 82. And I'm sorry, that's from my law enforcement background. <laughs> so it's, it's um, at E I O, and I'm typing it in D I O N. D I O N V G. So like Victor Golf 82. 82. Okay. Uh huh. And um, just quickly, like, I don't know if you guys can see this. So I've made, um, what's this called? Chicken and waffles. <laughs> chicken and waffles using a tepary bean sauce and this is all natural the only things in there i use maple syrup to sweeten um it and i've used the bubble cured bubble kibari um chiltepinas to make it just a little bit spicy so yeah. super versatile um the mac and cheese that i've made and this has just the tepary beans and green chili um and cheese um so Super versatile, I love it. This is a French toast that I made with the sweet tepary bean sauce with a blue um, pinole crumble on top and some pumpkin seeds. Um, so yeah. Can't wait to come out to the cafe. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So these are the, the tamales that Nina, <laughs> that Nina so loves and uh, use corn to make a cheesecake. So this is a cotija cheesecake with a corn creme anglaise. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely in the works for hopefully this fall. Yeah. And so it's the catering. Yes, soon we should be able to start um, caterings. Um, and with the catering will come, of course, the educational part. So, yeah. We'll have to do a workshop with you when the museum Absolutely. is up and running with lots of people at it again. <laughs> That'll be really cool. And we are happy to come to Tucson or Phoenix and cater from, um, you know, a distance, but we're happy to come. And as the onset, there's always an educational component as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much. It's been super informative and really important to know where our food comes from. And as you said, food is power and to empower our youth to continue these very vital traditions.